that's my instinct. I mean, I think you're raising so such big issues, and we'll actually like kind of walk some with you to walk some get you a really big audience. Um, is is to perhaps to to throw it open. Um, that because I think in a sense, you know, you're so expert, and I think that people may have. You mentioned the strapado, but in, in, in these in classic terms, the strapado isn't the missing, mm. like behind mm. it back, and, it's, and you cut over a beam, the rope goes over a beam, and it's subjected to sudden drops, which dislocate shoulders. Yeah, I think that there are two, because you're, you're absolutely right, um, and I think that there are two, because there is one which, which you're hung up by your hands and, and you um, suffocate in the end in the same way as with crucifixion. And the other, you're absolutely right, you, you, you do exactly that. And, and actually, apparently, nicely, both are used in Pakistan. So, okay. yeah, so I remember uh, reading something that Clive Stafferson is saying that several of clients showed signs that they've been subjected to. Mm. It seems to be one of the default options. Um, I, guess, I guess it's kind of not very labor intensive. Um, I don't know. But, mm. um, yeah. Just in, in the case that you mentioned where Colin Powell used the information extracted by torture to take, a, to take martial action and so on, do you think that they, I mean, in some cases, are they actually is the whole point of torture not as we think of it to extract information but to get people to say the right thing or almost um, come up with a script that's been, that they need? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that is right. Um, I mean, it, it, it is a lot of it's about reality, actually. It's funny, it's not just about, it's not just about that there's a key bit. It's being, that being proved wrong. Right? Yeah, so you go in, you go in knowing what you want to find, and then you find it, and you say, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. And, and also, I think there is this thing of information. You know, um, I think the Americans were quite unprepared in some senses. And, you know, I mean, still ludicrous stories about Inter interpreters, for instance, mm -hmm. where uh, one of our, Muhammad al Barani, the kid, ended up having this ludicrous interrogation where he was talking about um, Zalata, which in Arab, apparently his Arabic, in Medina Arabic, means salad or tomatoes, and in Yemeni Arabic means money. And so the Americans said to him, What money did you have with you when you were traveling to Pakistan? And it was translated, and he thought it was, What salad did you have with you? And he was like, You guys are crazy. You know? And he was like, I, did, I didn't have any. And they're like, You must have had it. You must have had it. And he said, No, 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 I really didn't. I could, I, you know, if I really wanted it, I guess I could get some when I got to Pakistan. <laughs> and, and they got very excited about this. And, and they got out the maps, and everybody started writing things down. And, right there, where was he and they thought he was an Al Qaeda financier because he, I mean, it was unbelievable. And that was one of the bases on which he ended up in Guantanamo Bay for seven years. And I think, I think that there is a real, I think a lot of it is cock up, but there's also a thing, as I say, I think when you pay for information, that you then want it confirmed, or, or you're starting from a position yeah, where you, exactly. And a lot of the issues we're having at the moment with getting people out is that they are in Guantanamo on the basis of information from one person who has also given information in relation to another person in Guantanamo Bay. Mm. And so we, they don't want to say, for instance, to France, this guy is completely innocent, so you can accept, you, you know, you can take him into your country, because that would mean saying that the informant on who someone else's testimony relies is unreliable. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I think, I don't think that they're bad, you know, I, I'm not anti-American at all, I think it's a wonderful place. Um, but I, I do think that there is, uh, uh, I think it's, very, it comes from fear, probably. Well, it also comes from a, um, a loss of, um, a loss of the, the capacity, I mean, it comes back to what you're thinking, loss of the capacity to interrogate in other ways. Mm. Well, I, I, mean, I mean, interrogation, somebody put it to me over the weekend that the police are now much better interrogators than the secret, have been better interrogators than the, the secret services, because the police know that what you're doing straight up is trying to find stories. Mm. So they put a great deal of effort into following stories, whereas mm. particularly the American secret service, the Americans learn fast, mm. they can be very fast learners. Um, have kind of lost that capacity. Mm. Um, There's an American interrogator in a book um, called How to Break the Terrorist, who is yeah. FBI and police trained, who found the guy who got hit down in Pearl. He uses soft interrogation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you get from the effort, which you made me think of earlier, is a very strong sense that the hard interrogation, the torture interrogations, are about the establishing of dominance. Yeah. They're not about information. Mm -hmm. 
they're about taking a group of unruly um, foreign people who have done bad things in the United States go down yeah. and saying, look, it doesn't matter what you believe, but we do as you do as Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I think that's, I mean, that's getting brought out very forcefully in, in, in the interrogation scene. But it's simply yeah. about um, the exercise of power. It's pure expressivism in the sense that it's almost it's sort of torturous performance art that we do. Mm. It's, it's the use of power for the sake of it. Um, well, and to say it, that, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just, um, what that puts me in mind of um, is Abu Ghraib, actually, and the accounts of the um, treatment of the detainees there in, um, for example, stand operating procedure that books in the film. Well, um, there was no inter intelligence um, bonus from a lot of the treatment. I mean, it's piled up and sort of naked of Iraqi prisoners and so on, most of whom, or many of whom, have just again been um, taken off the streets in swoops where they say, well, you know, one mustache unit Arab looks much like another to us, so we'll just take that one. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's not really any pretense, really, when you see those photographs of any um, intelligence benefit from the way in which she's been, been treated. I suppose a classic example of power for power's sake is uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki when they had already surrendered. We've got a nuclear device, so we can use it. Uh, I have a different case, and I, I, think, I, I, think, I think that's a different case, and I don't. What, uh, the, the other thing that's going through my head when you're both talking, um, which I, I've been meaning to take my kids to see today, which is. Um, Algiers, the Battle of mm -hmm. Algiers, mm -hmm. yes. which is what it seems to be one of the other great depictions of torture. Mm -hmm. Not a not a pumped up Hollywood one, but a very I mean, if you know that movie. Mm -hmm. it's, sort of, it's about the French in Algeria and it's got the most extraordinary torture mm -hmm. scene in it. And it's all the worst because they are indeed two humans. Yeah. And, and it's very interesting. I spent far too much of my life now thinking about torture, but what one of the things that I think is very interesting and, and trying to put a conference together and, and one of the things that was suggested to me was to get somebody who could talk to the way in which that affected the French psyche yeah. because yeah. it almost apparently split the nation between those who thought it was a good idea and those who were appalled by it uh, by, by being the torturers um, and I, that was something that I think is very interesting and another thing which um, was thrown up um, I think by somebody's question, <laughs> which, which I thought of and then forgot, uh, relates to um, Clive, my, my boss, when he was looking into this stuff, um, tried to track down a whole bunch of torture experts, people who were torturers, who'd done it courageous, who were really good at it, the, the, the torture foo guys. And one of them was somebody who had tortured people in Vietnam. And he said, which I think is really interesting, um, I just remember what it's related to, and it will come here. Uh, he said, which was really interesting, um, there's only any point in torturing somebody for about two days after you capture them. Yeah. Because to begin with, that's when they want to talk, and, and when you first capture them, they will talk. But, the, but secondly, that's the only time they're likely to have useful operational information. Because once people know that they've been captured, um, they will change any plan that that person knew about. Now, obviously, there are, there are exceptions to that in that they might know the identity of people. But generally speaking, um, the idea of torturing people for you know two years or, or with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed um, for you know I can't remember how many times it turned out he'd been water walked 140 seven times or something extraordinary. And you're just like, actually at that stage there's nothing left. You know either the person A has probably lost their mind, but B there's very unlikely to be anything that anybody can say that is going to make a difference. <coughs> you know, that there'll be any more information they can give.